Hey, what's up? It's Mr. Bill. Before you listen to this podcast, I just wanted to plug my dates. On November 30th, I'm playing in Sydney, December 12th, San Francisco, 13th, Nevada City, 14th, LA, 18th, Denver, 19th, Meow Wolf, 21st, Columbus, and January 11th in Philly. Also, I'm about to put a new EP out on my label, Belegal Beats. Go to belegalbeats.bandcamp.com to check that out. And uh, yeah, enjoy the podcast. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you are listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you're 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 listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. All right, welcome to episode 12 of the Mr. Bill podcast. Uh, Jan is going to interview me this time because she was on... Well, I guess... Um, <clears throat> well, what's going on is we're traveling at the moment through Australia doing a bunch of shows and it's difficult to find guests here to do podcasts because everyone in Australia is like so... Uh, they're like too cool to do them or something, <laughs> I feel like. Or I don't want to ask people here because I know they'll be like... I don't get what a podcast is. I feel like podcasts are like a fairly American thing. There's a couple of like New Zealand and Australian ones that I listen to. Like um uh the worst idea of all time, where there's that those two New Zealand comedians and they just watch the same movie over and over again for fifty two weeks in a row. Right, you told me about that. And they just review the same movie every week. <laughs> That's fucked. So I figured we could do another one. Um or well, actually you came up with this idea. But the angle this time would be that you interview me. Yeah, I think that would be cool because, um, you know, most people who listen to this podcast at this point are probably still there because they're just Mr. Bill fans and they find you really interesting. And as far as I can see, you haven't done that many like podcasts or interviews. No, I've right? done. Um, I did one with Garden Sound and one with Musa, but I've never been on like a big one as far. Oh, actually, I was on EDM product. Uh, I think there's this guy called Sam Matler and mm. he does this EDM production one, which I was on. And mm -hmm. then there was also, I think, a bass gorilla one, which I might have been on. Nice. Actually, the guy who used to do the bass gorilla one, he, he edits this one now. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, his name's <laughs> Robert Fumo. Well, I figure the first thing I would ask is like, what is the question you get asked the most? Like when people go up to you at shows and they're like, oh my God, you're Mr. Bill. Like what, what's the first thing they ask you? Mostly it shows, I feel like it's not so much people asking me questions anymore. It's more so just people being like, hey, thanks for the Ableton tutorials mm -hmm. or hey, really stoked about everything that you do or just like paying respect and just being just wanting to say hi to me just for the sake of it, I guess. Yeah. Or just to say thanks or something like that. But um, as far as like questions that I get asked, I mostly get asked them online. The biggest one is probably just like how I go about uh, either starting tunes mm -hmm. or finishing tunes mm. it's like one of the two mm -hmm. do you have like an faq where you answer these already like have you written down something where it's like this is what i get asked all the time and these <laughs> are my answers i have an faq on my website actually um but i don't think it answers those specific questions but it does answer like more technical questions about the website i think uh -huh. and i think it answers like some faq shit about like my setup like what speakers i use and Nice. all that which i should probably update because i think it still says event opals and i've upgraded since then yeah to barefoots that's sick well i figured we could just like answer those two questions first like how do you start tunes and how do you finish tunes because mm -hmm. maybe that's something people are listening people are wondering who are listening to this yeah i feel like chelsea manning right now <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by that because you interviewed chelsea manning Oh, I did. Yeah. So Chelsea Manning's this uh, American whistleblower, probably best known because she leaked a bunch of documents to WikiLeaks in like 2009. Um, yeah. And she was in prison for, I know she had a 35 year sentence and I think she served like seven years of it before Obama pardoned her. And yeah, I did one of the first like big public interviews with her after she got out of prison. Yeah, in New York, right? Yeah, in New York in front of, like, a few thousand people. But I also feel like that was such a cop-out because, like, 
people came like I, I read the Twitter responses to that interview afterward and a lot of people were like, Oh, you're not a real journalist, you're just her friend. You didn't ask like the hardball questions. What would the hardball <laughs> questions have been? Oh, I mean I think it's just the typical stuff people ask um whistleblowers like do you think you betrayed your country like would you call yourself a traitor you know what do you think of people who say you're a traitor etc they seem like pretty surface level questions yeah but they're also like the controversial questions true yeah <laughs> um well yeah looping back to how i start tunes and finish tunes um the way i start tunes usually is um i never like i would say 50 percent of the time i actually have an idea where I'm like, oh, I specifically want to make this melody or this beat or something and then turn that into a song. <clears throat> and then I would say the other 50% of the time, I'm like, I don't have an idea, but I just want to write music. Mm -hmm. So the 50% of the time that I have the idea already, put that down onto paper, you know, like, so to speak, or into Ableton. And that's, that's the easiest ones. The harder ones is where I don't have an idea and I still want to make a song that day. And then I have to just generate an idea. So I'll do a bunch of, there's a bunch of ways to do that. Um, one is like, uh, it's usually pretty destructive stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, just trying to generate MIDI, like drawing one MIDI note and then arpeggiating it and recording that output and then putting that through the same arpeggiator again, recording the output again, putting a MIDI chord plugin on it and a MIDI velocity plugin on it and all sorts of stuff. And then just running it through like presets or something and just seeing if anything comes out that that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Or taking like a... <clears throat> like an old school funk record or something like a wave file or mp3 and just stretching it really far and just seeing if you can find any like cool textures or grooves in there mm. or something that could be fun or just going through old projects that i've started and seeing if there's any cool ideas in there or whatever yeah and usually it's just trying to throw shit at a wall and <laughs> see if i can get any sort of generative idea out of it that inspires me yeah. and then that will start to like stimulate more ideas from me Interesting. Um, I was gonna say, like, I think I've seen you do this thing where, like, you listen to a sound and you just, like, know how it's made. So mm -hmm. would you say, like, in the cases where, like, you think of an idea and you just want to get that out onto Ableton, like, you always just know, like, pretty much what to do there? Uh, if I have the idea in yeah. my head? Yeah, usually. If, if you, like, hear a sound in your head and you're like, I want to generate that sound. Yeah, usually if I have, like, an entire, like, orchestration and like a bunch of there's like a bunch of textures in there of like separate layers and stuff like that i usually know like what kind of layers i have to make to make it sound that way mm -hmm. but I, w I would say like my execution is still not as perfect as my imagination i don't think it ever mm -hmm. could be really i think your imagination is always going to be that little bit better because mm -hmm. it's all and it's all yeah every time you like bring it into the real world it's always going to just be like looking at a tesseract in the third dimension kind of thing mm -hmm. i feel like it's almost like your imagination is just so much more vivid or yeah. at least for me it is yeah. and then when i bring it into the world i'm like oh it's not as cool as i had imagined but it's still kind of cool <laughs> still pretty cool yeah i've heard people say like you sh like when you're starting out doing production or sound design you should just like listen to songs and just try to like recreate all the sounds that you hear and just kind of get a feel for like like this sound is made using this kind of synthesis, etc. Like, do you ever do those kinds of exercises? I definitely used to do those exercises more. Um, I don't do them so much anymore. But when I was at university, we had a bunch of um, like listening exercises like that. But most of them were like EQ related. Mm -hmm. They'd be like, here's a kick drum. Uh, this is what it sounds like. And then they would give you another kick drum mm -hmm. and be like, this is what it sounds like. It's had some EQ applied to it. What's been done? You would have to figure out kind of like which area has been boosted by how much or cut by how much or whatever. Huh. And you would have to do it without messing with an EQ. So you'd have to, they would just show you two things and you'd have to be like, oh, that second one has had like a four decibel boost at 10 kilohertz or whatever. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. And they would do like a lot of tests like that. So that was really good, like being forced to do that a lot. As far as synthesis goes, I feel like it was just a matter of like playing around with synthesizers a lot and then inevitably you will like stumble across sounds that you've heard in songs before and you'd be like oh that is like that sound from uh, yes. from that like noisier song or that that house tune or mm -hmm. oh that sounds almost like a hi-hat or a kick drum or something like that and then you would kind of sort of stop yourself there and then work back and be like how is it that i got to there and why mm -hmm. does that sound like a kick drum now or whatever like sound design knowing how a sound is made is really just like a whole association thing 
it's like associating certain things with certain sounds and then all of a sudden you have like the association of like, I know what FM sounds like now or mm. I know what additive stuff sounds like now. And yeah. then as soon as you hear something in a tune, you're like, oh yeah, it sounds like FM or additive or whatever. Yeah, so you kind of just get, get that knowledge from just generating a bunch of sounds and kind of like remembering what the process was for getting them. Yeah. And like later mapping that back when you listen to that sound. Cool. So you actually went to school for audio production. Mm-hmm. Audio yeah. engineering or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, I went to SAE in Sydney for audio engineering. Do you think that was a pretty useful experience in your career? And like for new producers, would you like recommend going to school and getting like some kind of formal education? It's hard to say whether or not I would have like worked everything out anyway. Mm-hmm. It's like impossible to say. It did cost 55000 Australian dollars. Oof. And... <laughs> So, so cheaper. I think that's actually way cheaper than un- U.S. universities. Yeah. How maybe? much? Um. So for those listening, Jan dropped out of high school when she was 17. <laughs> she didn't actually even finish high school and then went to MIT and did a degree <laughs> in physics. Yeah. And then you went to Stanford and started doing a PhD in physics, right? Uh, Yeah, I started and then dropped out of my PhD. So would you class yourself as a physicist? Uh, I mean, not anymore because it's been... Ugh, I want to say like seven years since I've done any like serious research in physics. And like actually in my life since then, I haven't had to use my physics knowledge in any way. Uh, I guess I use math sometimes, but not like physics really. <laughs> I feel like you use maths a lot. Like last night when I was watching you do Python programming stuff, it seemed yeah. like you were using a lot of math stuff. Like there was a lot of logic stuff. It was like if this happens yeah then this would happen i mean i would call that logic i wouldn't really call it math like i don't know it was yeah maybe like you you would classify logic as just like a simple form of math or something but i would classify it as an equation yeah and i would classify almost any equation as somewhat math related yeah then again i don't class classify synthesis as maths Right, but actually it is like highly mathematical, like all the stuff going on really? with waveforms and such, yeah. In what, what sense would you say? Uh, I mean, I, I just think that like under the hood to like do like waveform, like transforms and signal processing and all that stuff, like, you know, yeah, you're yeah. not doing a lot of math, but like your computer program is doing a ton of math. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like a very mathematical thing, but it's like for the producer or whatever, you you don't actually have to do any of that work. Right. Um, yeah, so how much did it cost you to go to MIT for, for how long did you go? Four years? Uh, yeah, four years. I don't actually remember, but okay. I do know um, MIT has like a really good financial aid, um, financial aid program. And so like, I think at the time I was going like your family, if your family made under like 60K, I want to say, like it was basically free. So Oh, nice. So you yeah. went for basically free then? or uh, I think... We still had to pay, but it was like yeah. less. Yeah. Crazy. So but I think if you went for a full price, it would like for all four years, it would probably be like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Holy for sure. fuck. Yeah. That's insane. And that's like US dollars, right? Obviously. Yeah. US yeah. dollars. For, yeah. Not no, Australian. They're, they're just a US campus and they just like charge in Australian Israeli shekels. Yeah. Like Zimbabwe <laughs> dollars. That's crazy. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I went to SAE and as far as, whether or not it was worth it. I did learn a lot there. So the, here's the thing is I like already knew a fair bit about Ableton and stuff because I was like already studying it pretty heavily just by myself mm-hmm. for a couple of years. So when I got to SAE, they were like explaining stuff like audio theory, like waveform theory and like the harmonic series, which I guess you would also cover in mass, mm-hmm. like acoustic stuff, which is like kind of mathy we learn about like mastering stuff and live sound stuff and like all of those things are things that I probably never would have learned about otherwise if I hadn't have gone and studied there. But I think that um, everything else, like how to synthesize a kick drum or how to make a banger, like (laughs) all that kind of shit is stuff that I absolutely didn't get any help from, from SAE. In fact, I would say I got like whatever the opposite of help is 
from that from so like from it was essay. detrimental to your knowledge of like how to make bangers to some degree yeah and and like and there's two reasons why one is because the teachers were all like ableton is bullshit it's a dumb program what and so is fruity loops and so is like everything else other than pro tools and logic basically what crazy yeah, do, you, is, do you feel like they still have that attitude or was that just because it was like in the early days of ableton? i think it might have just been because it was in the early days of ableton that huh. they were just like this bullshit and, and the program sounds bad which from which i've learned since from a programmer's perspective is the most bullshit thing ever so there's this one thing that like a lot of um old school mentality pro tools users and stuff say about ableton where they're like the summing is bad but it's like what, what does is, that mean summing means like the program's ability to take like a 100 channel session and sum it through a two channel bus i see but from talking to programmers enough about this who build daws they're like dude it's literally like a one plus one equals two type equation mm. there's no way that the summing is different in any program actually mm -hmm. <laughs> um so that has been like since uh demystified and is no longer a thing that i believe is ex exists at all it's just some bullshit that people like hear mm -hmm. and you can actually do phase tests between each of the daws to disprove it anyway so that was one thing is that all the teachers were just not supportive of me using ableton at all and then the second thing is that like um they all had this idea teaching from like a fairly traditional like band mixing standpoint so they were just like don't over compress things don't over distort things um don't, <laughs> don't throw 100 otts on yeah don't put everything. 100 otts on it. i mean i don't even think they know what ott is <laughs> and they were just like you know don't do all of this extra stuff that i that is you know essentially the whole backbone of what i do now what do you think it, so like back then um i don't actually know much about the history of ableton but i've heard you say like it was kind of the early days and like there yeah. were not many people like using it or doing tutorials on it so yeah. like what was it about it that made you interested and well for me it was just um my friend frosty was using it mm -hmm. and he was the one who kind of got me into electronic music in the first place and also i don't know like i'd been using a lot of other daws like i was trying to use fruity loops a bunch and i was trying to use logic and um, at the time logic was owned by a company called eMagic. It wasn't owned by Apple yet. Mm -hmm. So it was on version five <clears throat> and loading that up and trying to even get a sound out of it was like impossible. And then every time I used Fruity, I was just like, this is such a dicky weird program. <laughs> and then I used GarageBand for a while and I thought that was pretty limiting. And then I used Cubase for a while and I thought that was pretty weird. So I, I kind of used all of them. And then I just got to Ableton and I was like, this makes so much more sense than every other program and it's so much easier to use. Wow, interesting. Yeah, but also when I started using it, those crazy limitations, like, you know how when you go to the audio effects section now and there's like, you know, 50 Ableton audio effects? Uh -huh. At the time, there was four. <laughs> what were the four? <laughs> it was like EQ3, oh my God. Uh, compressor. Uh -huh. I can't remember the other two, but maybe like chorus and maybe like yeah something else uh -huh. <laughs> it was like super limiting and then there was no audio effect racks Whoa. there was no instrument racks there was no operator i don't even think i had any built-in synths maybe so would you just um, have to download like a third party you synth? could only use vsts in it as far oh, as oh I, I see and then um it had like a i want to see like a 16 channel limit <laughs> like, <laughs> 16 <laughs> yeah it was something like that oh like you God. couldn't you couldn't make any more than like there was like a limitation to how many channels you could have. And then I remember they upgraded that to 99 channels. Oh my God. And then I remember they made it unlimited. Yeah, there was a bunch of weird limitations. And also my computer at the time was so shit that I had to like render everything to audio. So I would do something in MIDI. Like mm -hmm. I couldn't run really more than one VST at a time. <laughs> so I'd run like one VST and then I'd have to resample it. And then I'd like write the next part of the song with another VST and then resample that and so on and so forth. Do you feel like um, having started using Ableton in those early days like affected your affects your process today? Yeah, like, I think you still so. have some of those habits left over from. <laughs> to some degree, I think what happens is when technology evolves, I try to evolve with it though. Yeah, I try to be like, oh, okay, cool. Like, there's no need for this other thing now. Computers are fast enough, and limitations are not there anymore. So, like, I can just do it this other way now mm -hmm. if it's more efficient. <clears throat> but yeah, I definitely think resampling. In general, I definitely wasn't the first person to do it. There was like drum and bass people and stuff doing it before me. But I definitely think resampling specifically has like a very specific sound and a very specific like sound design style and editing style to it that sounds really good. Mm -hmm. And that was completely, I think, due to the limitations of computers. How's uh, your music going? It's uh, very 
sporadic, I would say. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I definitely, well, like, I think we talked about this a bit in the last podcast where you said that you are one of the few people who never gets stuck. Mm-hmm. Like, your process is often very reactive. Like, like you'll hear something or, like, uh, someone else will do something that gives you an idea and you can just, like, act upon it mm-hmm. immediately. Um, and I think that's, like, really helpful advice because a lot of people like me just, like, get stuck constantly and we're like, oh, no ideas. Um, and something I think you've said in the past is like when you hit that wall, you just you can't like stop. You just have to like keep pushing through it, or else you get stuck yeah. forever. Yeah, I think it's almost like a. Um, it sounds weird to to liken it this way, but I look at it almost like the same way as exercise. It's like I need a lot of self discipline to like go and do exercise kind of thing. Yeah. And if I don't, it's like super easy for me to just be lazy and sit around at home. Mm-hmm and not do anything and i feel the same way about writing music it's super easy for me to like not write music Mm -hmm. it's really i totally can see how it's easy to get to those points where you feel a little bit stuck and just be like fuck it and just stop writing but i think what makes like prolific writers versus non-prolific writers is they get to that point and they're just like no i'm not stopping fuck this i'm gonna figure out a way to get past my mental thing yeah and i think that's related to why people so often ask you like how do you start or finish a tune because that's two places where people get stuck a lot and then they just like give up or something yeah well finishing a tune is much like starting it really it's like you're just starting it from the other end so when you're like writing a tune what's the percentage of time would you say split between like writing music versus like mixing and mastering and all that um i would say like right right maybe even like 50 50 Mm. i think like I think writing the tune for me at this point takes like maybe between 10 and 20 hours. And then I would say like mixing slash mastering, it takes also maybe like between maybe like five to 10 hours. Uh huh. Cause well, maybe even 10 to 20 because I need to take a lot of breaks when I'm doing that stuff. Yeah. Because you mix it and then you're like, this sounds great. And then you, your ears are so fatigued by the end that you think it sounds great. And then you stop and take a break and then come back and realize that you've over compressed everything and made everything way too bright mm-hmm. and slammed the master way too hard. And you're like, shit, I need to pull everything back. And then you pull everything back and then give it another break and come back and realize you've gone too far in the other direction. Yeah. And now it's like not hitting hard enough or not quite clear enough. Yeah. So I find I need to like do a few sessions like that. And each time I like pull everything back or push everything forward, it takes about an hour to go through like every channel and do that. And then. Uh, I guess you could just do it on like the master or you could do it on buses or whatever, but I just somehow do it in this long, stupid way. <laughs> and then um, it just takes me a, like, it's like a pendulum. Uh-huh. And I just eventually like end up in this middle point where I'm kind of, where I can come back to it every time and be like, yeah, that sounds like a nice balance of pushed and clean. Yeah. And you think it takes so long, main, mainly because your ears like need this resetting time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. I think like I don't know how to think of it really. Maybe your ears are like a muscle or something, mm-hmm. or um, it just gets fatigued after a while. Yeah, something like that. But also, your brain is like a, a thing that can get desensitized to things, right? Like if you expose yourself to something enough, it becomes normal or it doesn't mm-hmm. seem weird. And I think sound is like that a lot, like especially sound. Mm -hmm. Because if you like expose yourself to like this one thing over and over again, it eventually just doesn't seem abnormal anymore. It seems like correct. Mm -hmm. Sort of like a pop song, right? Like if you listen to a pop song for the first time, you'd be like, this song's fucking weird. It doesn't sound that good. Yeah. But then like if you hear it in every shopping center and every Uber you get in and like every gym you go into and like your workplace is playing it yeah after like a few weeks you'll be like oh yeah that song yeah it's got like you know that that weird hook that's kind of cool though Mm -hmm. and like your brain starts to become familiar with it and you start to enjoy it or whatever yeah for sure do you often just ask so one thing like it occurs to me that you can do is just ask people for feedback be like oh does this sound like too compressed for you etc like when your ears are tired Mm -hmm. do you do that much like yeah, I do that a ton. I think getting as many ears as you can on it is super important and advantageous. Yeah. And I try to do that for every track. I try and get like somebody like you to listen to it. <laughs> and then I try to get like someone like Ula Sile to listen to it because he's from like the dubstep community. Yeah. So he's going to obviously preference the more bright, like pushed clean stuff yeah. or even distorted stuff. And then I'll give it to someone like Ryan from the Psytrance community who's going to preference like way more conservative mixdowns. And then 
I'll give it to like, you know, Primo, who's the guy who does all the mastering for Beleagle Beats. And Mm -hmm. I'll give it to, you know, some mastering engineers who master house music like Matt Davis, who's the Mm -hmm. guy who is also the acoustician for my studio. Um, And I find, yeah, if I give it to enough people and I get the same comment back from all of them, like that's there's way too much of that or something i'll be like all right that is a for sure problem uh-huh. and then if i get like other comments like oh you know from all the he's like it needs to be six laughs louder <laughs> like, and then i get something from ryan being like it sounds a little too smashed already yeah and then i get something from matt saying like oh, i think it just has too much low mids which is making it bloated or yeah. something like that then i can kind of like take the overall curve of all of their comments and be like Maybe it's not so much a problem. Maybe this thing is just all of the, they're specifically just having those individual tastes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of them likes extra loud music. The other one, you know, likes more conservative music or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's important to get a lot of ears on it. As soon as you say say stuff like this, my mind just goes to like, oh, there should be like a website or app to do this automatically where like you just upload different versions of a tune and like people do like blind listening tests and vote on them. Like, is this too loud? Is this too bright? Et cetera. Yeah, you you could. uh, How hard would it be for you to make a web app like this? I think it'd be super easy. I mean, like my concern with things like this is just it's too specialized. Like, obviously you and like people in your discord would probably find this useful but like i don't know there's always this calculus in my head of like how much effort is this versus like exactly how many people will find this useful (laughs) yeah you can almost think of music like that too right you're Mm -hmm. like i could spend a million hours making this ambient tune but how much happiness is it going to bring to people really and how much is it going to like better my career and all this stuff like that but I feel like with music, there's some degree of like, oh, will making this thing make me happy? Like, will it make me fulfilled? Whereas for like making web apps and stuff like that, it's like literally if it only benefits me, then it's useless. Like The kind of inherent value in it is that other people use it. I don't know. That makes I feel sense. like people would use it, to be honest. Yeah. Would you use JavaScript to do that? Yeah, I, I, I kind of try to do everything in the browser, so people don't need to download apps. Yeah. It's probably worth mentioning. I don't know if we mentioned this in the last podcast that you work uh, really closely with the guy who invented JavaScript. Yeah, Brendan. Uh, Brendan, I, I would actually... Well, yeah, we were just saying he, like, he should definitely come on this podcast because he would have That would be so overpowered. You would be so overpowered. <laughs> yeah, me talking to the creator of JavaScript. No way. He'd be like, oh man, I'm talking to Mr. Bill. I'm so, I'm so overpowered. Do you reckon he knows my music? Oh, uh, probably. Yeah. Super weird. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, so the other day when we were just walking around Melbourne, like, Bill got recognized in a deli. (laughs) Yeah, totally. We were just trying to buy some halloumi. (laughs) Yeah. And someone was like, oh, my God, my boyfriend is the biggest fan. Would you mind waiting here for 15 (laughs) minutes while I go and get him from the car? (laughs) And I was like, "Uh, sure, I'll just stand here for 15 (laughs) minutes while you go and get your boyfriend. And then she was like, wait, just let me call him real quick. And then she called him. And was like, hey, uh, you got to come in here. Guess who's standing here? And, and he was like, who? She was like, Mr. Bill. And he was like, oh, cool. I don't want to come in. And then she was like, no, you've got to come in. This is what he wants. <laughs> He's like, this is what Mr. Bill wants and has worked his whole life for. So he can stand in delis and <laughs> people can come in and say hi. Yeah, she was a bit obnoxious, but. I also appreciate that stuff a little bit. It's cool. I mean, having fans is cool for sure. Do you ever get free stuff? Actually, yeah. The time that I went um, <laughs> with Donald to that pizza place in Boulder. Yeah. Uh, Donald is a friend of Jan's who also went to MIT. We went to this place in Boulder to get pizza and the guy was like, oh, I totally know who you are. You're Mr. Bill, right? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, cool, man. I've got this pizza. And we didn't have to pay for that pizza. Well, it's pretty sick. Yeah, it was awesome. Damn. I think we still had to pay for our beers. Do you think bass music is just going to be more of a thing in like cities around the world? Because obviously it's already a pretty big scene, I would say, in like Denver and San Francisco and such. But I think it's getting not places like Beijing. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah, I definitely think it's getting bigger. And I think some people out there who are like specifically riding the line between like sort of the poppy dubstep sound and the weirder bass music sound, like specifically someone like Subtronics is a good example. Mm-hmm. He's just like going to get so fucking big. Or like, you know, Bass Nectar is mm-hmm. he's like kind of been a pretty big ambassador for bass music. Yeah. And um, I mean, I think even he might be the reason why bass music is called bass music. Right. It's kind of like um, how I think Space Jesus is maybe the reason why 
there's a genre now that people are referring to as space base Mm -hmm. or like that you know people also um sometimes refer to stuff as like that wakan style yeah or something like that Uh, and i think like those kind of people like space jesus subtronics boogie t um squanto uh pretty much like the whole grave dancer crew they're all so fucking big that like yeah i think they could really take it to those places like i know subtronics has already done a china tour and all of the shows he did look nuts wow it was like at least 500 to a thousand people at each show it looked like that'll be sick do you already get to tour around a bunch and go to a lot of different countries and if so like what are what would you say are like the differences in the audiences and fan bases from country to country yeah pretty much the only places i tour is australia india america Mm -hmm. canada sometimes mexico and sometimes israel but i kind of don't know if i should go back to israel because every time i go there i get like um harassed by fans harassed what do you mean <laughs> like ha- harassed by american fans oh because they're like you're supporting oh i see what you mean yeah okay, you're supporting yeah. like the palestine israel True. issue or whatever True. and i'm always like oh, i don't know how to feel about this right you know on like one side i've talked to bleep bloop about this before and he's like yeah i would never play there mm-hmm. and then i've talked to other people who just say that they don't see it as a problem Mm -hmm. where do you stand on that if you want to talk about that uh honestly i i feel pretty poorly informed on that issue so would you play a show in israel um i think i would probably lean towards not just because i wouldn't want to like upset people but true i'm like pretty low on the scale of like uh being willing to upset people so yeah fair enough. So, but that's a personal call and i don't know if i would like necessarily judge other people for making the opposite decision yeah yeah i i've been over there to play like maybe five times and the first few times like the maybe the first three or four times i had nobody say anything but the last two times i went both times i've been hit up by at least five people each time who well, are like, oh, you're like supporting the oppression of Palestine. And I was, and then I was like, oh, I don't know about that. And then I looked into the issue a bunch and I was like, uh, it's a pretty complicated issue where a bunch of people are telling a bunch of different stories and I don't fully understand it. So I don't know how I feel about it. But yeah, I'm not sure if I'll play there again. And <clears throat> I still haven't played in Europe or the UK or anything like that. But yeah, as far as the differences in crowds, I feel like it just ranges from like you can play heavier, weirder stuff to like sort of straighter stuff in some places and then weirder stuff in other places. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like Denver, you can get pretty weird. Um, Australia, you can get pretty weird. Uh, Israel, you can get pretty weird. But then there's a lot of places in America where you don't really want to get weird, I feel like. Oh, yeah. Um, Like like what? Like I would say something like DC is Mm. a place where you wouldn't really want to take super weird music there Mm -hmm. seems like most people there are just wanting to listen to you know pretty heavy straight dubstep Mm -hmm. um i would say maybe la Mm. or something like that i don't know it's hard to say Mm. uh maybe like chicago it's funny though because like a lot of these cities now that now i'm saying that I bet people from those cities will be like, no way, we yeah. love the weird stuff. And yeah, it's like, they're going to message you. And yeah. But before you message me, trust me, you don't like the weird stuff. I've gone to those <laughs> cities and played the weird stuff and people don't get down. And then I've gone to those cities and played the heavy stuff and people have gotten down. So <laughs> my experience has been, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Preemptively yeah. address that concern. One thing I've noticed with you and shows uh, having been like, with you for a few now is that you don't really get nervous oh yeah and that's like very surprising to me because i still i don't know i've played like a couple dozen and i still get like jittery before every every show yeah well i've played like hundreds of shows at this yeah. point what point at what point would you say like you stopped getting nervous like after probably, how many probably after like show a hundred <laughs> where i was just like this is it's just fine yeah but even still i would say yeah like 50 shows in i was still like getting a little nervous Mm -hmm. and then it just would like it just tapered off from there i think but it has just gotten to the point now where like even if i fuck up work the fuck up in my favor sort of i don't know like in any spot where i feel like people aren't getting into it i feel like i have a versatile enough catalog now and like enough uh like routines for lack of a better word to Mm -hmm. like go into something where i think at any point i could like pull the crowd back and stuff and I'm also pretty selective about the shows that I play. Like I never take a show where I would 
feel nervous, you know? Nice. Like, I would feel nervous if I was taking a show where I was playing with, like, Excision or something like that. Because then all I would be thinking before I was playing is, like, oh, fuck, I wonder if the fans are going to, like, if Excision fans are even going to understand what I do and stuff like right. that. And then I would probably get nervous. Right. Also, I don't play shows that big anyway. Like, the shows I play are, like, 200 to six or 700. I think I would get nervous if I was playing to, like, 10,000 people. But, yeah, generally, I just, like, also have a mentality of if they don't like it, then, like, who cares? There's not much I can do about that. Sure. Like, all I can do is play my tunes that I write. <laughs> like, I can't really... I can play tunes I write and the tunes that I have, which is tunes that I like and think would go well. Right. And anything beyond that, I can't help, you know? Like, I can't... <laughs> there's not, nothing. I, there's literally nothing I can do. Yeah. So, there's no point worrying about that, right? I think the word, like the most, I mean, the closest thing to negative feedback I've seen on your shows is just people being like, I expected you to play this style, which you used to make or used to be more into, and mm. it was completely different or something. Yeah. I mean, that happens with every artist at some point or every band, you know, like a, it specifically happens with bands where they'll make like one breakout album, like, and it'll be the sickest shit. Mm -hmm. And then they'll like go into writing, you know, like Carnival is a good example. They, they were this Australian rock band and they, their first album was like this super edgy, weird, I don't know. It was just like super unique. No one had really done that before. And then their next album was kind of like pop rock. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like they just wanted to sort of get down more with like the radio side of things and start playing like the bigger festivals in Australia and stuff, mm -hmm. which is totally fair. And also I'm sure they enjoyed doing that too. But, like, a lot of people were like, what the fuck? They should have written their first album again. And it's like, dude, if, why would they write their first album again? They right, already, it's been done. <laughs> yeah, they already wrote their first album. So, I don't know. I feel like people just have a hard time accepting that artists grow and move on. It's like, if you're still stuck on, like, my first EP, then just go and listen to my first EP. Like, I'm not going to play it anymore because I've, like, moved past it. I just, I don't know. It seems so weird to me that people are... Because here's the thing. It's like... Somebody who's, who listened to my first EP, they will then detach completely from my work and my life and then just come back to it to interact with it like years later, right? And expect mm -hmm. the same thing. Whereas I haven't detached with it and I've interacted with it every single day since then. Mm -hmm. So it's like, of course, there's going to be like some sort of progression there. Right, right. If I had have done what they did with my music and not listened to it or touched it for the last few years, I might come back and still be satisfied with that. Right. I think that might be the thing that's fucking it up for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> and I also think you've especially have just changed through a lot. Of, like you make a ton of music and a, a lot of it's in like different styles. And so if someone's listened to just a small slice of it, they might like extrapolate and be like, oh, that's what all this music sounds like. But in reality, it's like such a big catalog of stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's happened from promoters before who have booked me <laughs> thinking that I would play like a specific style. And then I've played like a bunch of new shit or old shit. And they've been like, what the fuck is this? And then, oh, yeah. Did they actually get mad at you? Or well, yeah. I've, I've actually had promoters in the past like message wow. my agent and be like, we thought we were going to get a set like this. And we got a set like completely different. Oof. What the hell is going on? <laughs> wow. That's crazy. And um, yeah, I mean, I think at this stage, what I've pretty much done is just normalized to where like my regular set when you see Mr. Bill on a poster is just going to be heavy shit. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be like all the heavy stuff that I make. It's not going to be any of the weird, glitchy, down tempo y, delicate, detailed stuff. Because that there's no point playing that at a club. No one dances. No one cares. Like everyone is not there to listen to that stuff. That stuff might work in like some instances at a festival, like really, really early in the morning, mm -hmm. like 4 or 5 a.m. when the sun is just about to come up. Yeah. Or just when the sun is about to go down and everyone is just sort of like had dinner or something like that. Yeah. But it's not going to work at midnight at the black box <laughs> or like it's not right. going to work at like midnight at DNA club, you know, right. like, at the banger hours. Yeah. That's like fucking full e-boy hours where <laughs> <laughs> everyone's trying to drink their vodka sodas yeah. and, and get their fuck on. <laughs> <laughs> would you, would you prefer to play more of those like, uh, sets where you can do glitchy weird stuff? Like, is that more your speed these days? Um, I'm happy playing banger sets and I like the fact that when you play the, that stuff you can see like an extroverted reaction mm -hmm. like you can see people dancing so you can kind of deduce that they're enjoying it right. um, when you play the softer stuff 
quite often somebody who might be enjoying it more than anything they've ever enjoyed in their life is just staring at you. <laughs> so it's hard to tell. Yeah. But like I've had that experience before when I've played down tempo stuff and someone's just been staring at me. And then later on after the show, they come and ask you about it or they come and talk to you about it. And they're uh-huh. like, dude, that was like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> and you're like, really? Fuck. I, I did notice you in the crowd and it seemed like you were bored. Yeah. They're like, um, no, I was staring so hard. Yeah. They're like, no, I was just like soaking it in. Crazy. And because they'll just, you know, there's no way to outwardly express yourself to that style of music really. So it's just like better. Like, I don't know. It's just easier for people to, to, um, to just stand there and enjoy it in their head. I would, yeah, I want to do more of those glitchy sets, I would say. Yeah. Um, but I think it's just a matter of finding the right clubs and all the right festivals and time slots to do it at and then billing it correctly. So, like, don't bill it as a Mr. Bill set. Mm-hmm. Bill it as, like, a Mr. Bill IDM set or something like that or, like, a Mr. Bill down tempo set or something. Yeah. Um, I think that's an important distinction that Tipper figured out because he writes, like, up tempo and down tempo and he figured out that billing it as such allowed people to know what to expect right because he does a ton of like sunrise and sun sunset sets right and those are all always like well i've only been to one live tipper show and it was a sunrise set last new year's yeah like i think it was one of the best like crowd reactions i've ever seen like everyone was just so into it and like it was weird but people were like really really just like soaking it in Mm mm-hmm um yeah his his down tempo sets are really sick yeah i've actually asked you in this pa- in the past about this but how do you think tipper got to be so big right like because there's festival there's so many festivals where you know he plays and it instantly sells out yeah i think he's um he just has like a crazy cult following at this point i think it's a mixture of him just being so good and also just ha- having done it for so long and also he's been so particular about what he's put out and stuff like that. He's just, mm-hmm. everything he's, yeah, he's just been really particular about how he's played the game <clears throat> and it's just worked out really well for him, even though it took a really long time. Right. But I think he just writes music in such a way that like, if you like weird shit, you'll like him. If you like heavy shit, you'll like him. If you like really detailed sound design, you'll like him. If you like really beautiful melodic stuff, you'll like him. If you like really nasty <laughs> fucked up bass sounds you'll like him like yeah it, it, if you like really clean mix downs you'll like him if you like really dirty sound like he just covers so many bases mm-hmm. where i think he can like pull from so many fan bases and pools like i seen him play to twenty thousand people at camp bisco and people were loving it and then i also saw bass nectar play to the same twenty thousand people playing way poppier sounding stuff mm-hmm. and they were also loving it so it's like he has like the ability to to play to that many people and have everybody sort of like it and it's really palatable but he also has the ability to play to like a really weird crowd who will only like the snobbiest weirdest electronic music and they will also like it you know yeah um how much of his success do you think was just because he's such a talented producer and how much of it was some kind of marketing or things that are external to like actual production talent i mean i don't know i'd be inclined (laughs) to say it's 50 50 for everyone to be honest yeah i don't really think production talent has that much to do with it i'm just yeah i would say it doesn't matter who who you look at it's always 50 50 or even not 50 50 it might even be like i don't i don't know i think like getting big subtronics was talking to me about this one day and he said he he explained it as like a five pillar system or something Uh he was like you need uh, a really good personality a really you need to be a really good producer you need to have like a really sick team you need to have like really sick social media skills and it was like one other thing like you need people need to be able to like identify with you mm-hmm. a lot or something and i think out of those tipper has like most of them apart from the fact that he doesn't like do a shitload of his personality on social media yeah i see almost no social media <laughs> yeah from tipper actually yeah he just doesn't seem like the kind of guy that that is into doing that yeah and i think it's really cool that you can get that big without having a huge social media but can you though because who else has gotten that big without doing social media oh man i feel like last time you asked me this i gave you an example but i can't remember like banksy yeah it was banksy yeah banksy that's it yeah but i think yeah maybe in both cases like banksy and tipper they're both kind of mysterious personalities because like tipper shows like you barely see him as a person like he's kind of hidden yeah, but mm-hmm. I guarantee you there's, like, thousands of people online who are trying to do the mysterious thing mm-hmm. who have two SoundCloud followers. <laughs> and they're just like, fuck, how do sure. I get this mysterious thing yeah, off the Yeah, how do I ground? become Banksy? Yeah, I don't think it really works. I think it just worked for Tipper. I think, like, what's tried and true is, like, solid marketing stuff. 
I feel like if you if you I don't know it's hard to say but I, I feel like if Tiffa did do social media and like a bunch of marketing stuff he'd be like worlds bigger than he is pretty. really maybe I mean who yeah, knows yeah maybe that's true because I have talked to people who are like pretty deep into EDM like producers I guess people who are like more on the Skrillex fan base side of things who have just never heard of Tipper yeah and I'm always like how how could you like not have heard of Tipper yeah he has like a cult following fan base of like maybe i don't know how many people in the u.s maybe fifty thousand or a hundred thousand uh-huh. and they're like that pool of people just go to every single show he plays i think mm, interesting which is like still insane like it's not to discredit it at all right but yeah it's uh it's, yeah i don't think it like that model specifically works like I, I don't think it's i don't think you can say yeah, it's as simple as just being really good and not doing anything other than making really good <laughs> tunes because there's a yeah. lot of people who do that, who make yeah. sick tunes and just never post about it and never do any marketing, who just don't get big. Well, I think another thing Tipper has is he's like a really good live performer That's and true. DJ and he's yeah. like good at scratching and there's yeah. like a very like live aspect of performance. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, his sets are pretty amazing. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think something that, that he's done too is <laughs> he's just made it like it's very clear what you're going to get when you go to a tipper show whether you go to the up tempo set or the down tempo set it's like you know kind of what you're going to get i think one of the things i've done that's fucked shit up for me is like made too many different styles of music <laughs> and i think when people come to my shows they like don't know what to expect and that's why i get some of those people being like oh i thought you were going to do this and then <laughs> it was completely different yeah and also i think i'm just not as like particular about like guarding anything and i think when you guard things like tricks and music and unreleased stuff and whatnot to the degree that he does um it kind of makes it more special when you when he plays because he'll, he'll play a bunch of tunes that only he has kind of thing right whereas with my stuff it's like i don't only like give all my unreleased music away and just don't give a shit about it yeah. i just like post it on discord and stuff like that but i also give like every single trick that i have away to and i think that allows people to take this like reductive mentality towards my stuff because they're like oh it's just that thing and it's like yeah it is just that thing but you didn't work it out like you don't know you didn't ever know that and if i never told you that you would have never figured it out and probably would have thought it was amazing right yeah so it seems kind of like a double-edged sword right like your openness Mm -hmm. and educationness about things right because it also has made you like it's what a lot of people know you for it's like that person who does ableton tutorials on youtube yeah exactly um i definitely don't i mean yeah, maybe this is a personal thing, but when I look at that, I'm not like, oh, now like I understand everything about how his tunes are made. Mm. I think if anything, it makes me like more impressed because like I kind of see all the work that goes in and like all the all the tricks and stuff. Yeah, that that is what I <clears throat> thought would happen initially. <laughs> I was really? like, yeah, I was like, if I just show everyone exactly how I do everything, it'll make it more impressive. Yeah, because for sure. then they'll see exactly how much bullshit it isn't mm-hmm. and how it is actually just a lot of hard work. But it seems like it's had like almost the opposite effect in a lot of cases where people are just like, oh, it's just fucking Disperser OTT. Wow. Or it's like, or or, or people being like, oh, cool. Yeah. No, what? Yeah. Nice lesson, bro, on how to put 100 OTTs on something. It's like, (laughs) yeah, but you never would have figured out that 100 OTTs would have made an all pass filter. Right. It's like, because you just wouldn't think to do that, right? Right. Like, I didn't even think to do that. I think it was Virtual Riot who showed me that originally. Mm hmm. Well, and I think somebody showed him. It's like I don't even know who the original person was that thought to do that, but whoever thought to do it, it's a super creative thing to think, right? Mm-hmm. To just keep duplicating an effect. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, but now people are like reductive about it. They're like, "Oh, it's just that," and it's like, "Yeah, it is." But you didn't think to do that. Don't um, don't try to pretend to yourself that you thought to do that because you didn't, and you, <laughs> and you wouldn't have. I guarantee it. Yeah, it's like once the idea is out there, it's like, oh, so obvious that you know you can do this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like. Yeah. Do you mostly get those comments on YouTube? I feel like there's a particular kind of like negativity that's specific to commenters commenters on YouTube. Yeah. And also on Discord, I think a little bit too. Like I'll be having a conversation with someone and they'll just be like, oh, how did you make that sound? Is it just this, this and this? And it's like, yeah, it is just that, that and that. But like 10 years ago, that would have been considered pretty amazing. Right. But I guess that's also cool though. The fact that like it's not considered amazing now because then it's like people have to figure out new, more incredible shit to like impress people. Right. And therefore like sound design and stuff has to get better than where it is now. And For sure. So that's kind of cool. What else do you want to talk about? <laughs> uh, let's talk about programming. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think one thing that's kind of changed my 
view on programming is well i wouldn't say change like totally change my view but one thing i notice is like a lot of things people do in music production and djing is just super repetitive and like a thing i'm specifically interested in is like how do we get rid of repetitive stuff i don't think repetition is a bad thing though i think like as far as songwriting goes repetition oh, no, 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 no. i don't mean like sorry i don't mean like repeating things musically i mean like having to do boring stuff like putting cues in every track and then copying oh, those yeah. cues over mm. etc yeah, yeah true or like if you're making a sample pack or like rendering stems for someone like having to sit there and like render one by one yeah or like when you tell me like every time you make a project file available on your website you have to like go through this whole process where oh, you like yeah. clean it up and like name everything accordingly yeah like standardize it yeah i think that's a lot of like what techies always try to solve right is like how to not do repetitive stuff it's kind of like what accounting people try to solve with like accounting software right they're like why don't we just put the values in once and then like have it be some sort of malleable system that kind of changes with every new bit of data that gets thrown into it from your system sort mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah. So you, you think like um, there should be some stuff being developed like that for music people? Yeah, sure. Cause, cause what I see like programming wise in the music world is people developing like VSTs and like new synthesizers and sound design tools. And that's all like super great, but what I don't see is people making more tools to just like automate the boring parts of doing stuff. Like every time I see something that's like repetitive um, in, in a process, I'm like, oh, what if you just had like a script to do that? Right. Yeah. Which you've made a couple of. Yeah. So one thing I made uh, for Bill was the script that kind of copies cues over from Ableton to Record Box. So um, what you found out was that an Ableton ALS file is actually just an XML file, but it's a gzipped XML file, right? Yeah. So or even it can just it can also just open XML files that aren't compressed. Oh, really? Yeah. True. So what is a gzip file? Uh, so gzip is a, c a compression algorithm, and the compression like does not mean like OTT compression. It just means um, you know taking a file that has some repeated chunks of data and making it a smaller file. Because instead of, um, let's say a file has like uh, a string that's like a, 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 like 20 times. Instead of writing the letter A 20 times, you can just say like A repeat 20 times. And that's like a smaller string. And so mm -hmm. that's how essentially how you make files smaller is you take like duplicated information and just uh, represent it in a more concise way. Mm. Mm. So um, when you do something like file compression with say like, wave to flack they say it's like a lossless compression but some people disagree um, wait how can you disagree you, about you that because like it's, it's phase cancel yeah it's the same <laughs> audio some people are just that dumb but like <laughs> like how 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 does the compression work from like wave to flack for instance uh i don't know the specifics of how flack works but i'm pretty sure like basically it's doing what i just said where it looks for like repeated chunks of data and, and that would be like makes... repeated samples uh maybe i don't i don't know if it would map directly to like samples and sound it might just look at the data in the file and just look for like repeated strings and such and you found a way also to pad flax to make it <laughs> any size you want right yeah so this is kind of a funny thing because i noticed bill with some tracks you were making them exactly like 55 minutes 55 seconds 555 milliseconds etc um, and so I was like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if that file were exactly like 500? Uh, oh, like 55.5 megabytes? Yeah, 55.55555 megabytes. Yeah, I guess like with WAV files, it, if you have a file of a certain length at a certain bit rate, then, or I guess maybe not bit rate, but of a certain length, then it just ends up being a certain size. But you can actually make that, you can kind of manipulate that size by compressing it to FLAC, which makes it smaller. And then just like adding a bunch of zeros to the flak file. So it still opens as flak because you've added those zeros in a place that's not like uh, read as audio. It's like read as a metadata field. So you just add shitloads of metadata to yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to get it to like the exact size. So you how want. many zeros do you have to add to add 0.1 megabytes of size? Uh, I don't know, like thousands. Jesus. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, that, yeah, that's kind of sick. 
I like um that other track that I had, the one with Band Doom, that was two minutes, 22 seconds, yeah. 222 milliseconds. You were able to make it 22.2 megabytes as well. Something like that, yeah. But that's all pretty silly. That's like not actually useful for anyone. It's just like a silly side project. Yeah, so the script that you made, which people can find on your YouTube channel, which I think is just Yarn Z. It's Yarn XC. Yarn XC. Yeah. On YouTube. Um. You did a thing where you can use a Python script to look at an ALS file that has a bunch of Ableton clips in it. And then all of those Ableton clips can have uh, warp markers in them. And then those warp markers that are in the clips can then be applied to the same wave files in record box as cue points. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's because like, I also like I started DJing as a uh, using Ableton mm -hmm. um, about a year or two ago. and someone was like oh you should use record box because then you can just use cdjs and i was like okay great now i have to migrate my whole music collection and i actually did this by hand which i think is what most people do where you just like put every track in like make yeah. sure it's gridded right and then like put in the cue points etc um and did this for like hundreds of songs then i realized like you can just automate this and do it in five minutes with a programming <laughs> language like python could you so, only do it with python or could you do it with oh python? like pretty much any language that has a edit. library to read xml true yeah so what other languages have a library to read xml uh, i think pretty much all of them that true. have like reasonable libraries like javascript probably c c plus plus that would make sense yeah because yeah. it seems like xml is a pretty common file type yeah. yeah. And then you also got into um, editing API stuff to uh, to make controllers work differently with Ableton too, right? Yeah, I mean, I actually don't think this is... Well, so yeah, in the process of doing this, I found like Ableton's MIDI map mode actually just has tons of functionality now that perhaps it didn't used to have. Like, like you can literally, like uh, for a clip, like MIDI map the loop in and loop out points mm -hmm. um, but there's some things that you know are good to do programmatically in a script because you can't do it with just midi map mode for instance if you want a button to like double or have the length of a loop um you can't do that with midi map as far as i know because there's no like user interface element inside ableton that's like make this loop length cut in half mm -hmm. you can only map it to this one ui element that's like make the loop this length or that length but you know, not like in fact, not with like factors of two. Uh, right. I yeah. think you could do that with cliff X and X cues or X, X triggers or X clips. Oh yeah. I think. Yeah. Cl cliff X, I haven't really checked out, but from what you showed me, it seemed really cool. Like you can basically put like little snippets of code in a clip and then like map that to something. Like how does it work again? Yeah. So you make a clip like a MIDI clip or yeah. usually just a MIDI clip because they're quicker and easier to make. Yeah. And then you just put what's called an identifier at the start, which is just two of the square brackets. And then you just write whatever you want. So you could write in the identifier, um, cuddy boy or something like that. Uh -huh. And then after the identifier, you could put a bunch of elements like, um, yeah, code basically uh, to just be like, you know, take this element of Ableton and do this with it. So <clears throat> if you wanted to make like, something that just takes an audio clip and just cuts it into like 16 even parts or something like that. Mm -hmm. You could like write a little bit of code on a clip to make that happen. And you could just click on the clip that you wanted to cut into 16 even parts and then click the clip to trigger that action. And then it would just do that. Wow. That's, so that's really interesting. So basically clips, instead of being like audio clips, they're like clips of code mm -hmm. and like commands that you execute when you launch them yeah the best way to it's think crazy. of it is like the clip then becomes like a really eloquent uh controller so think of the clip like the apc uh -huh. and then you could just be like um you, you could just put like uh how many like actual things do you have on an apc like how many i think 40 like 40 buttons and yeah, then like 40 buttons. eight faders yep let's just say that you had like 60 points of tangible control on the apc mm. you could just make 60 clips in a channel and just have all of them like be similar actions to things on the apc and then that channel of clips is effectively then as useful as your apc nice but it's just so it's like just it uses like a the api uh, like a python api script to do all of this but it just does it from like clips instead of needing a physical controller. That's awesome. And you can make the clips like really long and crazy and 
yeah have a lot of crazy functionality in there rather than just having whatever it is the controller does you can also make um x triggers which is like a or x mappings i don't know what it's called but you can instead of having a clip be the thing that triggers that line of code have a button on your midi controller that triggers that line of code Mm -hmm. and then that line of code just lives in a text file somewhere on your computer that's awesome yeah it's pretty sick what are things like that that you wish people would make that don't exist yet Honestly, I reckon like a lot of it has been made and I think it's just a matter of me learning how to use CliffX better. Uh-huh. But every, I, th- I don't think I use it enough to be that good at it. And every time I do think of something, I just email Stray, the guy who created it. And he's just like, oh, you could just easily do that by using this line of code. And then I just put that line of code in a clip and click it. And I'm like, that's it. It's easy. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. I need to like, if I used it more, I could probably get better at it. But I think, I don't know, like, I almost feel like it would be more worth my time to just learn Python than to learn how to use CliffX better or something, but maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think with those two things, you could probably do most of the things that like Ableton exposes to users via like an API. Yeah, like yeah. even without Max for Live or whatever. Yeah, to be honest, I haven't learned how to use Max because nodes scare me. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't no like, could you just think of nodes like a line in a line of code? I think you can, but like in Max, don't you still have to like connect them and like drag and drop them? Yeah. yeah, I think, yeah, I think there are a lot of people who come from like classical programming backgrounds. Like, just that is, uh, I mean, I guess the thought, like, which may be kind of dismissive, is like, oh, you know, if I can just write code, why do I have to like interact with this visual element? But sometimes, like, having a visual component like that does just affect the way you think about things and, like, give you new ideas. Yeah, but isn't, yeah. like, the colorful text in Vim just a different visual element? Uh, yeah, to some extent. Um, I would say, like, yeah, that helps you, like, remember what, like, which parts of your code are, like, keywords, which parts are functions, mm. et cetera. Like, it helps with organization, for sure. Right. Yeah, it is kind of cool that you can just like sort of set the hierarchy and then later on in the code just be like, remember that hierarchy thing I said over here? Can we just pull that again and do this with it now? Yeah. Or something like that. It's kind of similar with Max, I think. But instead of being like, hey, remember that hierarchy that we made up here? Can we like reference that again in a piece of text and then do something with it? You literally just connect a cable from here to here. (laughs) Just be like, hey, take that signal over there. Yeah, maybe that's like a more natural way for people who've done stuff with like modular synths, for instance, because in that case, you're just like, you're kind of doing visual programming with just like physical cables and like moving them around. It feels very much that way to me. Yeah, it feels very much like modular synthesis. Yeah. Or even just regular synthesis, like, because when I think about like when I'm using a synthesizer, I'm generally thinking about the flow in my head of how everything's running anyway. How do you feel about like, what's your level of synthesis, do you think? Uh, I don't have that much experience with sense. Really? Like, what's your like most used one? Oof, I want to say probably Serum at this point. Serum, that's like a yeah. If I, I think if I had to use one, it might be that. Really? Maybe. I thought you would say Operator because you always like <laughs> talk yeah. about it in tutorials and such. If you could load wavetables into Operator, mm. I think that would be the be all and end all synth. Mm. And if they made the the additive component of it instead of being 64 Fourier parts. Fourier components or harmonics. Yeah, instead of being like broken up into 64, if it was broken up into like a thousand, Uh that would be fucking awesome. Because like they let you do, yeah, how would you, what do you call those things? Poles or like harmonics or? I would just call them harmonics. Yeah. Yeah. But then it's not just 16 harmonics, is it? Or is it like if you have it on, I guess it is just 16 harmonics, but it's like broken up into larger chunks or something. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it lets you break it up into 16, 32 or 64 harmonics. Um, if, the, if, it, if that oscillator area allowed you to A, import wavetables and B, have like a thousand additive or 2000 additive harmonics, I think that would be pretty insane. Do you think Ableton would add that? Or like, have they thought about adding a wavetable? I bet, well, Wavetable now, you can import your own Wavetables. I don't know if they would do that for Operator um, because Wavetable exists. So they'd just, if I told them to do it to Operator, they'd just be like, well, oh, use see. Wavetable. I see. Um, but also it's like one of those things, right, where if you add Wavetable support to Operator, it breaks automation or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Bill and I have this running joke that because Ableton's such an 
It's pretty old, right? It's like 20 years yeah, old. Yeah, it's built on like 20 year old C code or yeah, C plus code. Yeah, since it's like such a big and complicated piece of software, like things just get coupled that would make no sense to like be logically coupled. Like for instance, if you wanted to add a wavetable to your synth, like suddenly warping would break or like something completely <laughs> unrelated would just fail. Because that's what happens in like software projects sometimes. It's just like things get so old and like unmaintained that everything's just like tied to each other <laughs> yeah i think specifically like ableton has just like been around for so long and so many of the developers that used to be there just are not anymore yeah and yeah i think they um i'm pretty sure the people who developed the first like couple of versions are just not even there anymore yeah that so, would be surprising like the entire framework of the thing that's that it's built on is just i i know for a fact like because some some of the programmers there have told me that there's just shit in there that no one knows how it works, but they just know if they remove it, it breaks shit. Yeah. So they just leave it there. <laughs> exactly. And um, I know that they've been having conversations about rebuilding it for like, I think they had that conversation for version 10 where they were like, oh, we want to we wanna rebuild uh, Ableton from scratch. And then they would, for some reason that idea got canned and, and then they were just like, no, we're just going to keep building on top of the 20-year-old C. Yeah, but isn't that what Bitwig essentially is? It's like a complete rebuild of Ableton by yeah, the Ableton developers. I think that's what it is. And I think it probably started through a conversation like that where they were like, we want to rebuild it. And Ableton was like, no. And they were like, well, well we're going to go rebuild our own one. Right. <laughs> and then that's why it's so fucking smooth. Yeah. Like whenever you use it, it just feels so nice and smooth. Yeah, and you've said in the past that if, like, everyone that you collaborate with would switch to it, you would just also switch to it. Yeah, I think so. I think the only reason I don't switch is, yeah, because so many collaborators that I work with a lot use it, use Ableton still. And I just have so many whips in Ableton that I don't feel like I could just... It, it'd be too much work to port them all over to Bitwig. Mm -hmm. And I just can't be, like, bothered to port them all over to Bitwig. But generally, if I'm starting new music these days, I'm, I'll am start it in Bitwig. Mm, that's really cool. Yeah. I wonder if Bitwig, like how much could Bitwig, the software, do to automatically import projects from Ableton? Um, I don't think they've developed anything that does that specifically, but I don't even know if they would even have any benefit to doing that. I, I, I mean, I honestly think the benefit would be huge because there must be so many people like you where... If they could just import all their works in progress to Bitwig, they would. Yeah, the benefit for somebody like me would be huge. Yeah. But I don't know, like, do you think them as a company, it would get a lot of people moving from Ableton? I, th I think it would, actually. And especially, uh, like, if you're collaborating with people in Ableton and you could just, like, switch between the two pretty seamlessly, like, import, yeah. export, import. I don't know. I feel like a lot of people are hesitant to switch DAWs. They're like scared to switch or something because they've they've invested so much time mm -hmm. in learning Ableton that they're just like, no, I don't want to go learn another DAW mm -hmm. because I want to be productive this week and finish a tune for this show or something. So they, I don't think they would be so comfortable with just like moving to another thing. Mm -hmm. um, it'd probably be like you learning C or something or, you know, because... Well, I actually think programmers are really stoked to learn new languages and really? people are like... Maybe not me, but other people are like, <laughs> trying to constantly do it. Just because, like, yeah. sometimes when you've worked in a language for a long time, you, you're you just like, oh, this sucks. Like, I hate this thing and this thing and this thing. And then um, something new, like Rust, comes along. You're like, oh, that seems to solve all my problems. I'm just going to learn it. Yeah, I think programmers in general are like, do you think, I don't know, with musicians, there's a lot of this thing where, or with electronic producers at least, there's a lot of this thing where they'll be like, I don't want to learn a new thing or switch to a new thing because I know like X, Y, Z works and I just want to get like X, Y, Z done for this date when this release needs to be done or this date when this show needs to happen. Whereas mm -hmm. for, do you think programmers a lot of the time have those deadlines where they're like, I just need to have this project done by this time to be able to show yeah. this team of people by this date or whatever. So I'm going to switch to Rust to do that. Or do you think like at that point they'd be like, uh, Maybe it's not a good idea to switch to Rust because I have to have X done by Y date to show all these team people. Therefore, I should maybe just stay with whatever I know. Yeah, for sure. Like, uh, definitely there's a lot of times when there's a deadline and like a project has been written, let's say in C so far and write, just like rewriting the whole thing in Rust would take months or years. So like people don't do it and keep putting that off. But I think eventually, like if something, 
if something's like clearly a better choice like rust for a project then people will consider moving to it it's just a question of like what resources do you have and like how much time do you have to do a big migration like that yeah definitely at brave um which is the company where i work uh, we make a web browser and it used to be based on this thing called electron which um is like a framework for making desktop apps i think actually spotify uses it and definitely slack and a bunch of other popular desktop apps use electron but for us it was kind of like the wrong security model and there were all these problems with it that we just kept having to do as and at some point we just made a spreadsheet that were like here are the benefits of staying on electron here are the here are the downsides and here's the expected cost of switching to um using chromium which is like the open source version of chrome instead as a software basis for brave and we looked at that spreadsheet for a while and after um i think just a couple of weeks of deciding maybe even less we were like yes clearly like in the long term it makes sense to switch to chrome and it's going to take us months of just redoing work we've already done to do that switch but ultimately like in the long run it's going to save us time nice so then we did it and it was a little bit painful but like it had to be done you know yeah yeah and is everyone like really stoked now that that happened yeah i think almost everyone like the feedback has been pretty positive no one's like very no one's super sad that we ditched electron because it was kind of crappy anyway for us yeah right and Mm -hmm. was this like after brave had already been released yeah yeah this was um 2018 i think so we had already been released for two years oh shit yeah so it was a really big migration that we did damn and what was um the issue with electron uh it was never really designed for browsers it was kind of more for just loading like local content instead of remote content which is exactly what brave does yeah so we load remote content and so the security model is like kind of wrong because uh, with remote content you have to be like a lot more careful about how that code executes to make sure you're not exposing security vulnerabilities and also um there were just various components that electron didn't have such as a password manager uh, like a built-in password manager and like support for all these chrome extensions and people were asking us for this and we realized like literally if we just forked chromium instead of using electron we would get all all of those features for free that's cool that you found a solution to that yeah but definitely like you know i think in any field like music or software people are scared of big changes and having to do these kinds of migrations yeah yeah i think the equivalent would be like if i was in the middle of an album or something like that and i was like you know 60 percent done <laughs> yeah and it was all on ableton and yeah. then i was like you know what maybe it would take me like two or three weeks to move all of this over to bitwig mm-hmm. but maybe it would be worth it for xyz reasons and yeah. then i looked at a spreadsheet and was like yes this makes sense yeah then i would do it but i think like i haven't really i've never really made a spreadsheet i just think mentally in my head it seems like it doesn't make sense to move to bitwig for some reason yeah i mean from what you've told me it sounds like it would make sense only if they had um like really good import and export from ableton options such that you could kind of switch between the two yeah i think that that's the thing yeah i would want to be like kind of ampy daw stress (laughs) yeah (laughs) ambidostrous yeah actually from hanging out with you i've just seen like i guess before i met you i thought like everyone used ableton these days and i've just met so many people who don't like they use logic or reaper or Mm -hmm. bitwig Um, yeah yeah a lot of people just do what they can with what they have like that's what i've noticed in music it's just like people are just like this is what i got this is how i made it and it sounds good so fuck it Mm -hmm. It, there really is no way to tell is the thing and that's why i always was getting pissed off at my lecturers at university Mm -hmm. who were like hanging shit on ableton and fl and stuff because I guarantee half of the record, like they were talking about how like, oh, the latest X, Y, Z record is so good. And I'm like, I literally know the guy who did all the electronic stuff on that album in Ableton. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, there's no, I don't think there's any way to tell if something is made in any program. It's kind of, is there any way to tell that in code? Like when you open a VST, is there any way to be like, oh, that's definitely C sharp or definitely C plus plus or? Um, I don't think so because they all get like transpiled into like this one format and so you can't tell what like someone originally wrote it in right yeah Yeah. so it's kind of probably the same as a DAW right yeah Yeah, like they all just come out as wave files in the end yeah do you think like certain uh 
like the layouts of certain DAUs like lend themselves to certain kinds of like thinking or composition. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, like Fruity Loops is very modular and Bitwig is quite modular too. What do you mean by modular? As in like just anything can hook into anything. I see. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and modular specifically like modular synthesis, I think makes you think about sound design a lot differently because hmm. it's just not obvious to do some, some certain things like, um, like FM or FMing things with certain things in software is for starters, not obvious uh, in some senses, but also in a lot of senses, it's not even possible. Like for instance, taking the BPM of Ableton mm -hmm. and using that to FM the pitch of an oscillator. What? <laughs> like that's something you can do so easily in Whoa. modular. And it's something that like everyone always does. And it's like a baby could look at it and think to do it. Uh -huh. Whereas in Ableton, it's just not obvious to think to do that because there's no way to hook the BPM into uh into a oscillator to fm it crazy um or having like multiple bpm structures in ableton like having some things running at 120 bpm other things running at 100 and, or like a multiple of that like mm -hmm. you know a 1.5 or 2 point whatever it's like two or three or four like you know multiples of that bpm in either direction mm -hmm. and having other elements running at those multiples um which i'm pretty sure is uh the clock dividing, I guess, is what you would call it in the modular world. Mm -hmm. um, or like maybe a Euclidean rhythm might be the word for that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not obvious to think about in in the DAW world because you would never really like make a MIDI clip and be like, all right, that's a quarter notes at 120 BPM. Let me make like a multiple of that and mm -hmm. like apply that to a different sound and like make these really complicated like polyrhythm patterns and stuff like that. Whereas in modular world, that's also super obvious to think about mm -hmm. and do because of clock dividers. Just stuff like that definitely lends to like really different thinking. And I think like each DAW has its own things like that. Like Fruity Loops, for instance, anything can be a modulator. Like you can use any waveform, I think, of any clip to be like an LFO, I'm pretty sure, for any parameter. Well, <laughs> so you can take like, I think the, I'm pretty sure, and someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you can take like, like the waveform of a kick drum and every time you play that kick sample, the waveform of that becomes the modulator for like another thing. Also, the fruity granulizer is really sick. I feel like I can definitely hear when someone's using the fruity granulizer. Mm -hmm. Kind of sounds like Grain Scanner, actually. Yeah. Is Grain Scanner out yet? I think so, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, for those who don't know, Grain Scanner by Amazing Noises just came out, and it's so sick. It's like the best granulizer in Ableton at this point. Okay. It's way better than Granulator, in my opinion. Sorry, Robert Henke. <laughs> All right, how long is that? That's like 80 minutes. That's pretty it's decent. pretty long, yeah. Pretty that's around where my attention span dies if I'm listening to a podcast, so. True. Well, did you have any parting thoughts? Um, I was actually going to ask you because the focus of this one is like more on you and like your what you have to say. So what would you say to all my, the people out there? <laughs> my listening? parting thoughts? Yeah. Um, I would say be open-minded about how you create. Don't get stuck into one thing because that's dangerous and boring and just keep working at shit really hard don't when you hit that point where you're like i don't want to be creative anymore be like nope i'm gonna force myself to be more creative actually <laughs> and that's where you're gonna find like really good engagement i think from from your craft mm -hmm. rather than getting bored of your craft yeah that's all that's all my advice based awesome. on the things that we've covered I think. What else did we cover? Programming. Learn programming. Hating on <laughs> Chicago. Oh, yeah. Don't hate on Chicago. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks to everyone who listened, and I will see you in the next podcast. And thanks for coming on, Jan, and yeah. interviewing me. My pleasure. The last thing I wanted to mention is that you should rate, comment, and subscribe this podcast on Apple. Apparently, if you do that, it really helps the podcast. I don't actually know how it helps the podcast, but I've just been told that it does. So if you know how to go to the Apple podcast app and put a comment there, give it a five-star rating, uh, subscribe to it if that's a thing. I'm not actually sure. I'm not an iOS user. Um, then apparently that's really helpful. So yeah. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast.